turn in our hymnal to page 89, 89. If you will, turn with me to 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 8 through 15. Uh, if you have your sheet of paper, you'll, see, you, you'll know which, uh, what page it's on. If you don't have that sheet of paper, maybe you can locate it in your Bible. 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 8 through 15. This is not the ordinary Christmas uh, kind of scripture uh, that we have. But it fits so well with the Sunday school lesson that we had this morning, Come and See, which is about uh, Jesus calling uh, his disciples, and which was about the disciple Nathaniel, mostly, when Philip comes to him and says, come and see, come and see who he is. Come and see him. Come and hear him. Listen to him. And that's what the invitation still is, to come and see him. This passage is related to that idea. And I want to read it to you. But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, and not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, 
and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. Seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, that ye may be found in, of him in peace, without spot and blemish, and account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul is also, according to the wisdom given unto you, given unto him, hath written to you. There was a wonderful image that uh, was used by a preacher named George Buttrick in which he made this statement. God came down the back stairs at Bethlehem lest he blind us with his excess of light. God entered the world quietly. As Paul says in Galatians, coming in the fullness of time. Time is something that enslaves us in a hectic rush of today's living. We don't have enough of it. We, we, cannot, uh, uh, we cannot ever get done in the time that's allotted to us for what we need. And we find that Christmas Day is coming pretty quickly upon us. And every one of us is, has a little twinge in the knot pit of our stomach because we don't know whether we're going to be ready for, th for Christmas or not whenever it's supposed to come. You see, calendars are full at this time of the year. Clocks are everywhere. And we worry about being late for appointments. God keeps us, or keeps time rather, differently from the way we do. We worry about things, about being late. One day is as a thousand years, Peter says, and a thousand years as one day. In other words, time doesn't matter to God. Time doesn't matter. What is it that matters to him? God wants everyone, every person to have the opportunity to hear about Jesus. And if he delays, there's somebody that he knows that needs the Lord Jesus. And so he delays. All the time that the Jews were waiting for Jesus to come, not knowing his earthly name would be Jesus, they called him the Messiah. They called him the Christ. They wanted him to come. And they were waiting and waiting and waiting for him to come and praying for him to come. In fact, they always prayed the prayer. And Jews still pray that, pray that prayer next year in Jerusalem so that Jesus could come in Jerusalem. And all the while, and listen closely, all the while... God slips in the back door. All the while, God slips in that back door, bursting into time to deliver us a promise. Christmas reveals the story that God came once, and now God is delaying his coming back. I heard, and you heard, that Sonny prayed, come Lord Jesus. Not in those words, but he prayed that signs of the times are everywhere. Why does God, 
Why does God delay his coming when you and I are looking for him? Because I think he wants us to understand the promise of Christmas. He is not willing that any person perish, but all people come to repentance. Now the idea that is that we cannot afford to misunderstand that we ourselves are in that all. He wants all to come to repentance. And we ourselves are in that all. We're a part of it. And he needs to hear us from us. He gives us, this gives us three things that God promises us by his coming in the back door, by his slipping in the back door. The promise invites us to repent. Have you ever thought of God as slow? Slow to answer a prayer? Negligent in an area where you were concerned? Have you ever felt that he was falling short of your expectations of God? I don't know a soul who hasn't felt like that. I have prayed and prayed and prayed in my lifetime. And sometimes that answer to prayer comes like that. And then sometimes I pray and pray and pray and wonder if God has ten ears. Or T-I-N ears, not T-E-N ears. It bounces off his eardrum. My prayers have felt that way. Who wouldn't pray? for his little daughter to live. Ten days old. Who wouldn't pray for his grandson to live? Seventeen years old. Who wouldn't pray for his daughter to live? Forty-seven years old. Who wouldn't pray for his son to live? Forty-five years old. Who wouldn't pray and find out and believe that God is just not listening to what I'm saying and what I'm praying. You see, those to whom Peter wrote evidently thought that God delayed in, in our time because he wrote, he used the word slack. That, he, that some people call him slack that he's not interested in us as human beings. But I want you to change that from the way that I delineated it just then. I want you to remember there are ways to count that God does care. Instead of being slack, God is patient, long-suffering, He's slow to pay back wrong. He loves so much that he wants us to have time for repentance. God is wronged by the person who uses his name in vain at work. God is wronged by the skeptic who makes fun of Christianity. God is wronged by the atheist who protest his very existence. God is wronged by the person who is apathetic toward his promise. But God is patient toward these people. He is giving them time. Why? Because he desires that all come to him. They come from vanity to purpose. They come from skepticism to hope. They come from disbelief to faith. They come from apathy to sympathy. If he waits in time and they listen and look for his, for his coming. I think there's another promise from this scripture. And it's a promise that he calls us to account. Now this is something I wish to goodness didn't happen. But there are some people 
who you cannot pull to goodness until they have seen that their badness is hurting them. The promise calls us to account. It alerts us to a second coming of God. And this second coming of God, God is not quietly going to tiptoe into history. There will be fire, there will be heat, there will be noise that is that it was with his coming. There will be the terror of an unexpected intruder coming into where we are. There was a great Greek scholar of the Baptist faith who taught at uh, our seminary in Louisville for many years, and he was known as the greatest of the spirits of the Greek teachers in all of America and all of the world. His name was A.T. Robertson, and he describes this day from his study of the, Greek, of the Greek as a whizzing noise of rapid motion through the air, like the flight of birds, thunder, fierce flame. It's going to come in such a fashion as that. A.T. Robinson wasn't the first one to recognize something like this because Malachi says in Malachi, in the Old Testament, in the second verse of the third chapter, but who may abide the day of his coming? Who will stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And what is there in purifying silver? Heat, hot heat. And purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto God an offering of as righteousness their own souls if they have accepted Christ as Savior. This, there is an answer to Malachi's question, and Peter gives it. Those who stand are those who accepted God's Son, His promise. All will be called to account. All of us will be called to account. That Christ's second coming might be the motivator the believer needs to live an accountable life right now. How? First of all, the Christian is to live in holy conduct and set apart as one who turns away from things that don't honor God. And secondly, he is to practice godliness, reverence for God that overflows from him worship for, for the worship of him. He is giving us time for all of this to take place. God is not going to tiptoe into history like he did the first time. The first time he came in the back door, started off in a stable. This time he's going to come in preeminence. Lightning from the east to the west. Every eye will see him. Every eye will be there to, to, to know that he has come, and he will bring us all into judgment. And when that judgment comes, we will account for our lives. And you say, but Jimmy, that's going to be an awful day. It will be for those who don't accept Christ. You have sinned. By the way you used your money, you have sinned by the way you have used your life, and you're going to have every picture drawn for you to see. I used to think that, that, that we forget things until my brother Paul was in, his, in the hospital in 1986 with the attack that nearly killed him. He had, with a heart attack, that nearly killed him. He had a heart attack, heart surgery, a stroke, 
and brain surgery all within 10 days. We thought he, we were going to lose him, but he came back. When he came back, he wanted a piece of paper to write down stuff. Couldn't talk very well. And we couldn't understand him, so we wrote down. He wrote a name, and I asked him later on, who is this person? I knew the person. I knew the life he lived. I knew everything about all about him. He said, I don't know him, but Paul wrote it down. Now, where did he get that name? In that bank, that computer bank that's right back here, where God, the mainframe, plugs in and gets all the information he wants. And if you think that's far-fetched, I want you to go listen to the news today and listen to what happened, what's happening with Twitter. I want you to see that. Even the ones who tampered with government had their thoughts down and they could not erase them. That's what's happening. You're putting everything right back here. Judgment day, we plug it in. God plugs it in. And it comes up. <laughs> But I want to tell you something. There is something that makes me want to say hallelujah whenever I think of that. And that is that when he comes to those sins that people who trust in Christ have committed, it's going to be blank because God erases that through the blood of Jesus Christ. If you want another analogy, God spills the paint of Christ's blood over our sins in that judgment day. But don't you fret. We will be called to account. But this promise also causes us to expect, and this is what I want you to hear. We look when he comes for a new heaven and a new earth. Look at verse 13. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. We look for that new heavens and new earth. The dissolving of the old and the ushering in of the new is based on God's promise. And that's an expectancy of his second coming that is an anticipated quest for us. Contrast the excitement of verse 13, where we are ushered in to the terror that's in verse 10. Listen to verse 10 again. But in the day of the Lord, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which is the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the promises that are therein shall be burned up. Terror, terror. And then comes 13. Nevertheless, we, according to the promise, look for new heavens, a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. As Christians, we look forward to the coming of Christ because he tiptoed in at Christmas, but he's coming back with loud noise, lightning, heat, flame, sound of thunder, all of these things. He came in at Christmas in order to redeem our souls. So at his second coming, God will come in at the front door of our lives. And he will tell us, so Peter tells us, therefore, to be diligent, to be found without stain and without fault, and to consider God's patience. There may be a person here who's been waiting for God's coming. There may be a person here or in Africa who needs to make a profession of his faith. There may be one in Putin's cabinet that needs to make a profession. There may be one that Xi 
doesn't know about, there may be. And so God waits. But when he waits, a time will come when the waiting is all over and he'll be present in a flash, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. He'll come. Would you bow your heads with me, please? Father, we realize there's a big difference between your coming when Jesus was born and your coming when he will give us a new home on earth. I thank you so very much that you love us enough to send Jesus to be our Savior. We celebrate his birth, Father, because of the happiness and joy it can bring to us. We celebrate it with our family and our friends because they are people we love. We celebrate it with the world by giving to Lottie Moon Christmas offering. We celebrate it. But Lord, that's just as you came in the back door. But now we have to look forward to that front door opening and you coming with a blast. Thank you for giving us Jesus Christ to be our Savior. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.